Namaste. And thank you for being with us for another episode of Uladu Narpadu. Today we're going to look into verse 3, as this is when it really starts to get good. <laughs> what use is it to debate whether the world is real or unreal, sentient or insentient, pleasant or unpleasant? That state where, having given up the objective outlook, one knows oneself and loses all notions either of unity or duality of oneself and the ego is agreeable to all. Everybody's looking for something. All our activities, all our desires, all our hopes and dreams, our thoughts, our plans, etc., are based on this universal uh, impetus towards self-realization. We may know it or we may not know it. It doesn't make any difference. We can't stop until we attain it. Suffering is the goad. Huh? In uh, Vedic culture, there's one mudra, Ankusha mudra, which is like this. I'm not giving you the finger. <laughs> it's very uh, indicative of an elephant driver's uh, goad, which is a pole with a sharp end that he uses to get the elephant to move, sort of like spurs on a horse rider. So because of this goad uh, of suffering or ambition, desire, we can't stop. We can't help ourselves. We have to act. We have to move. We have to do something to better our condition. As long as we have a condition. <laughs> as long as we are conditioned. <laughs> so let's uh, look into this verse a little deeper. First, he said, what use is it to debate? My level of realization, my level of insight, my level of consciousness is going to be different from yours and from everybody else. So we're all unique individuals. We see things in our own ways. What use is it to debate? Are we really going to change anybody else's minds? Huh? The only way we can force someone to do things is by coercion, by some kind of force. And of course, that immediately rules out any change in consciousness or any change in outlook. So the master teachers of the world have never used force, the greatest teachers. Now, at a lower level of religious teaching, there are moral principles and rewards and punishments to get people to do or believe certain things. But these are inferior. Why? Because they use force and coercion rather than allowing a person to work on themselves and giving them methods by which they can get deeper insights. The religions try to set a code of what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, and force people to fit it. This is the Procrustean bed of morality. <laughs> Procrustes was an ancient king, and he had this bed. And you had to fit in the bed. And if you were too long, he would chop things off <laughs> until you were short enough. And if you were too short, he would stretch you until you fit. <laughs> Either way, it wasn't a very nice, um, pleasant stay. <laughs> and the same is true of morality. Morality, man-made laws. Uh, they say they come from God, but come on, it's really from our tastes. And my taste is different from your taste, which is different from everybody else's. Uh, because we're all unique, we're all individual, we're all at a particular stage of advancement in our march toward self-realization. So the real source of motivation is this, as we talked about earlier, the savita Savita Shakti, which is mentioned in the Gayatri Mantra, 
tat savitur varenyam. We accept this savitu, uh, this shakti, as our master. Why? Because it's the source of our life. The very source of our life drives us towards self-realization, if we're honest. If we're not honest, if we're insincere, well, that's another story. We're not trying to reach or talk with those people. We only want to talk about and with people who are sincere. So we don't offer any uh, prizes. Huh? We're not having a raffle this week. <laughs> we're not doing any more fundraising after the last one it totally panned out. Because why? You can't force anybody to do anything. And you, you can't create motivational factors without distortion. That's why we don't try to sell these videos, uh, even if we could. <laughs> What's the use of it? Or we don't try to give expensive workshops or seminars or counseling. Because even if people were to go for it, it would create some bias in the presentation. Huh? As soon as you know that somebody's paying money for you to say a certain thing, well, then you're going to say that thing uh, just to get money. And there are very, very few people who would be immune from that kind of motivation. So as soon as somebody starts to charge for knowledge about self-realization, it's a sure sign that they are motivated that they're not fully self-realized themselves. And of course, the greatest masters never charged. In fact, my Adi Guru supported me for many years. I was able to live in his temples and I had complete freedom because he understood that I was after the inner teaching, the esoteric side of the teaching and not the exoteric religious side. So anyway, that's another story. What we're talking about here is why should we debate with others? Why should we argue? Why should we give explanations and explications? Why do we do our uh, videos and take so much trouble? Well, actually, it's not trouble at all. <laughs> For me, the reason I do this is to help make my thinking clear to myself. If I can't explain something clearly and simply, it means I don't understand it. I haven't realized it myself. So I make these videos to help my own comprehension of this uh, material given by Ramana. Because if we put it into practice, not just read about it, not just think about it, not debate or discuss or argue about it, but actually do it, then we get the result. And what is that result? That state where, having given up the objective outlook, what is the objective outlook? I am. Because as the Ribhu Gita points out, as soon as you have is, it implies that. I am that is a complete sentence. I am a man. I am an old guy. <laughs> I am from America. Uh, I am silly sometimes. <laughs> These are all statements of being. And as we have gone over many times in this series on these channels, being requires triplicity, trinity, triad. Uh, there's always three factors involved in being, the subject, the object, and the predicate. The subject is the one who is being or becoming. The object is what he is being or becoming. And the predicate is how, or the relation. Uh, either the action or the relation or the quality or some descriptive uh, phrase. So as soon as I say, I am, I am requires an object. I am that. That's why the Ribhu Gita says, 
as soon as there is a little bit of mind, it becomes everything. Huh? As soon as we admit even am, I am, then it begs the question, what are you? Who are you? Where are you? And so on. So we don't even want to go that far. We want to get rid of the objective case entirely. So we can't even say, I am. We can only say, I, I, I. And this is where the expression that Ramana uses all the time, I, I, uh, this is where it comes from. It's an ontological statement of being beyond being and becoming. I know the language is, the language isn't equipped to actually discuss this. We're taking language here beyond its actual realm of usefulness and meaningfulness to say, I am being beyond being and becoming. What? <laughs> ah, you know what I mean, right? <laughs> what it means is there is a state and it's not a state of being neither a state of non-being. Because one who is in this state, this original state, is beyond being and becoming, beyond being and non-being, beyond action, beyond even consciousness, but is in a state of pure awareness and there is no object to this awareness, only the subject, I. So I, I. Not I am that, or not even just I am, but I, I. That's why Ramana says the primary mantra is I. And we find this as a practice to be true. That as soon as you say, I am, it begs the question, I am this, I am that, I am somebody, I am something or other. That's the objective mood. But if we just say, I, 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 the mind stops cold. It doesn't have anywhere to go. This is the pure subjective nature of real being, unconditioned being, unconditioned awareness, unconditioned non-duality. And this is self-realization. This is the actual aim of Advaita. And in this state, one feels, as the Bhagavad Gita says, na so chati, na kankshati, no hankering or lamentation. <laughs> the natural love and bliss comes out huh? because this is our real nature. I, I. So this state, beyond all notions of duality or unity of oneself or the ego, huh, is agreeable to all. Nobody has ever been found that didn't like <laughs> this state because it's just totally pleasant. Huh? Another quotation from Ribu Gita says, I am amiable. Huh? When you know that all is self, and we'll get into how the person in this state perceives the, the world and other beings. We'll, we'll get into that a little later. But when one is in this state, one sees all as self. There is no object. There is only subject. And because of that, there is a full affinity, a full affirmation of being in all states and conditions because one is aware of the root, I, I. So, Om Tat Sat Harihi Om.